Hi everyone and welcome to Ainan's very first virtual live stream service. This is a first for me and for many of us I'm sure. What strange times we're in at the moment. Just to let you know what will be happening in this Palm Sunday service, in a moment I will pray and then we're going to worship God together with some songs and the good news is that the words will appear on your screens so that you can all sing along. Now, before you panic, please don't worry. We have turned off everyone's video camera and microphone for the time being, so you can relax. No one will see you or hear you singing. During our time of worship, Tony will pray, and then finally, as it's Palm Sunday, I will share some thoughts from Matthew 21, the story of Jesus entering Jerusalem. At the end, we plan to turn everyone's video camera on so that we can all see each other and wave our arms and dance and shout. Should be fun, and hopefully the technology all works. If it doesn't, and if you don't see anyone, then I'm afraid something's gone wrong. Anyway, let's make a start, and let's pray. Heavenly Father, we, we love you, we bless you, and we praise you. We want to glorify your name this morning. And even though we're meeting in strange circumstances, Lord, I pray that your Holy Spirit will fall upon each and every one of us, will fall upon each and every home, and that you would be present with us. And Lord, as we, as we sing, as we hear your word, as we pray, as we gather, I pray, O oh Lord, that you would meet with us. Lord, help us to exalt you, help us to live for you, help us to bless you in all that we say and do, in Jesus' name. Amen.
Paul, when he's writing to his young colleague Timothy, says this, I urge then, first of all, that petitions, prayers, intercession and thanksgiving be made for all people, for kings and all those in authority, that we may live peaceful and quiet lives in all good godliness and holiness. This is good and pleases God our Saviour, who wants all people to be saved and come to a knowledge of the truth. So let's, uh, let's do that. Let's pray together. First of all, Lord, we want to pray for those who are in authority. We want to pray for those who are making decisions about our laws, about logistics of dealing with this virus crisis, those who are making decisions about equipment and supplies and planning the care for the sick. Lord, we pray that they would be bold, they would be compassionate, and they would be wise. Lord, we want to pray for those who don't know your peace. We want to pray for those who are anxious about this virus. We want to pray for those who are dealing with stressful situations, looking after children or loved ones. We want to pray for those who are worried about the future of their businesses and their livelihoods. We want to pray especially for the elderly and the poor and the most vulnerable. Lord, we want to ask that you would bring your peace into these people's lives. Lord, we want to pray for our fellowship. We want to pray for your protection over each one of us. Especially, Lord, we want to pray for those who are uh, in the medical profession and in the front line of uh, dealing with this virus crisis. Lord, we especially want to pray for Andy and for Emma. We want to pray for Gareth and Rebecca and Jackie and Leanne. Lord, we pray that you would be their protector, their shield. You would watch over them, Lord, in body, mind and spirit as they um, are in the front line of dealing with this crisis. Lord, watch over them, we pray. And remembering Matthew 5.16, in the same way, Jesus said, let your light shine before others, that they may see your good deeds and glorify your Father in heaven. Lord, we want to pray that we will be a people of good deeds, that we will be caring, giving, helping, encouraging, both within the fellowship and to our friends and neighbours and colleagues. And I want to suggest that we say the Lord's Prayer together. Let's, let's pray. Our Father who is in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us today our daily bread and forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For yours is the kingdom, the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen.
And now we're going to turn to God's Word and look at the account of Palm Sunday in the Gospel of Matthew and the chapter 21. As we all know, Palm Sunday is the time that Jesus made his dramatic entrance and appearance in Jerusalem as the Messiah. And it marked the beginning of Jesus's last week of earthly life and ministry. What is remarkable about this story is the deliberate preparation for the procession into Jerusalem, the in-your-face intentional publicity, which was so unusual to Jesus's normal way. And this can only be explained by the fact that he was now publicly assuming his true identity and deliberately proclaiming himself as the Messiah, coming as the King. By all of this, he was making it clear that only in him was God's plan and prophecy fulfilled, and that he was about to make all things new. Jesus was acting deliberately and consciously to fulfill prophecy and working out the will of God declared beforehand by the Old Testament prophets. Jesus had set his face toward Jerusalem for some time now, and he knew full well what awaited him. He knew he was going to the cross. He knew he was going to suffer. He knew he was going to die. But he knew he was going to bear the sins of the world. And Hebrews tells us that for the joy set before him, Jesus knew that his death would bring us life and that his father would raise him up. Let's start in Matthew 21, and I'm going to read it section by section. So I'm just going to read the first three verses, and then we'll unpack them before we move on to the rest of the story. Matthew 21, and starting at verse 1. As they approached Jerusalem and came to Bethpage on the Mount of Olives, Jesus sent two disciples, and saying to them, Go to the village ahead of you, and at once you will find a donkey tied there with her colt by her. Untie them and bring them to me. If anyone says anything to you, say that the Lord needs them, and he will send them right away. The first thing we need to understand is that God always prepares the way. Even as Jesus approached his time of sacrifice and death, in the middle of his turmoil and travail of soul, he submitted to the will of his Father. He followed the way prepared for him. God was at work here, and he is always at work. He is always active. He's always involved, always delivering his plans and preparing the way. And just as we have read, part of the preparation to enter Jerusalem involved Jesus sending two of his disciples into a village to do an important task for him. This shows us some key aspects of God's character. Firstly, the foreknowledge of God. This incident was a miracle. Jesus would have had no opportunity to make any arrangements for the use of these animals, yet he knew precisely where they were and exactly how the story would unfold. Such detailed foreknowledge reveals the glory of God, his divine omniscience. He is truly all-knowing. Jesus would not enter Jerusalem just as a pilgrim or as a rabbi, as he had done in the past. This time was different. Jesus would enter Jerusalem in a manner that would declare to all who he really was. Not only does it tell us of the foreknowledge of God, it also speaks of the authority of God. Notice the instructions to the two disciples. Jesus refers to himself in a quite a different manner than he has done before. Here Jesus tells them very specifically to say, the Lord has need of them. This was important. Jesus wanted to make sure that they used his proper title, the Lord the one who is ruler over all, the master. It was the Lord that had need of these two animals. And we too need to know that the name of Jesus makes a way for us. The name of Jesus is powerful. Just as it helped the two disciples to accomplish their task, it is our authority as well. His name is the ultimate authority. He is the Lord. 
he is our Lord. What we learn from these first few verses must encourage and it must strengthen us. This was pre-planned of God. Our lives and calling are all planned by him. God always has a plan for us and always goes before us and prepares the way. He knows our future. He knows what lies ahead and he goes before. And his name is all authority and power. We are his children, his loved ones, and he has put his name upon us. All we need is in him and in his name we stand. Moving on and starting at verse four, I'm going to read to verse seven and then we'll have a little look at what we can learn from these verses. Verse four, this took place to fulfill what was spoken through the prophet. Say to daughter Zion, see your king comes to you, gentle and riding on a donkey and on a colt, the foal of a donkey. The disciples went and did as Jesus had instructed them. They brought the donkey and the colt and placed their cloaks on them for Jesus to sit on. The prophecy referred to here is in Zechariah chapter 9 verse 9. The daughter of Zion refers to Jerusalem where Mount Zion is located. There were many prophecies concerning the Messiah and this one specifically foretold the manner that he would come as king. And we see straight away that he is a God of the detail. You may think it curious that Jesus rode the colt of a donkey. But in Judea, in Judea, sorry, there were few horses and those were mainly used in war. People seldom rode horses in common life or on ordinary journeys. To ride on a horse was seen as an emblem of war. To ride on a donkey spoke of coming in peace. And Jesus came as the Prince of Peace. In fact, kings and princes commonly rode on donkeys in times of peace. And it's mentioned as a mark of rank and dignity to ride in that manner. In Judges, in 1 Samuel, even in 1 Kings, we read of Solomon when he was made king, rode on a mule. Riding in this manner was significant and important. It was the detail. It was the appropriate way in which a king should ride and in which Jesus, the king, the Messiah, should enter Jerusalem. A conquering king would come riding on a war horse. But for his entry into Jerusalem, Jesus, the king, did not come as the leader of a victorious army, but as a humble servant who was offering himself to save and heal and restore. This was not the manner anyone expected of the Messiah. God is sovereign and works as he will, not as we expect. One of the commentaries says about this, he who makes his entry unarmed with unarmed followers on a peaceful animal must either be already acknowledged as ruler or he must aim at dominion in such a manner as excludes any force or political power. That certainly fits Jesus, doesn't it? He was already a ruler, though not yet acknowledged as such, and the manner by which he would gain dominion would not be by force or political power, but by being a servant king and becoming a sacrifice for all. Jesus came not in wealth, but poverty, not in grandeur, but modesty, not as judge, but as saviour. And even in these few verses, we see for ourselves that God is faithful, that a promise is a promise, that what he spoke back in Zechariah, he fulfilled. And God always does what he says. We can trust God to fulfill his promises to us. And what he has spoken over you and what he has spoken over me, he will do. He's a God of the detail. We can trust him to make our ways significant in his kingdom. He wastes nothing. He uses everything in our lives for significance. And he leaves nothing undone or to chance. If you seek him and serve him with all your heart, he will be found by you. And he will do as he has planned and promised for you. We can trust and we can rest in him. 
We're now going to finish the passage and look from verse 8 to verse 10. A very large crowd spread their cloaks on the road, while others cut branches from the trees and spread them on the road. The crowds that went ahead of him and those that followed shouted, Hosanna to the Son of David. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest heaven. And when Jesus entered Jerusalem, the whole city was stirred and asked, Who is this? Jesus' reception as king is immediate. This was a procession of adoration. The crowds see the disciples lay their coats on the donkey. They see the palm branches being waved and laid before him. And they begin to respond in like manner. We must remember that huge crowds would have gathered in Jerusalem for the Passover. And imagine for just a moment the commotion all this would have caused. Jerusalem is already in quite a state of excitement just because of the, the preparations being made for Passover. And then you hear and you see this large crowd of people coming over the Mount of Olives to enter Jerusalem. The people are cutting down palm branches and putting their coats down in front of Jesus as a, a sign of honour. At the same time, everyone is shouting, Hosanna to the son of David. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest. What a sight. What a spectacle. What the people were shouting was so fitting on this occasion. And it was actually a fulfillment of the prophecy as well. Most of what they were saying was taken from Psalm 118. Psalm of praise for the Lord's deliverance. And one of the Psalms often sung at Passover and other Jewish feasts. Fired with enthusiasm, they stripped off their coats. They made a carpet over which Jesus should ride. Such honours were often paid to great men. In the Bible, in John chapter 12, it specifically mentions palm branches were cut down and waved and placed before Jesus. The people appear to have behaved on this occasion as if it were the Feast of Tabernacles, where palm branches were used and the Jews celebrate their release from slavery in Egypt. What an incredible picture. The crowds moved by God in a spontaneous action, honouring Jesus in such a way because Jesus was taking all of us out of Egypt, out of slavery to sin, and into a promised land of salvation, liberty, and freedom. They shouted Hosanna, an exclamation meaning save now or give your salvation. And the phrase son of David is a direct reference to Jesus being the Messiah. What they were shouting out was exactly what was being done for them. Salvation was coming from the Messiah. Jesus was coming as Lord. The one who was from the highest heaven was coming to save them. And when he had entered Jerusalem, the Bible says, all the city was stirred, saying, who is this? All the city was stirred. Everyone was amazed. They were intrigued. They were confused, not knowing what to think by the procession that brought Jesus into Jerusalem. The king was there. The prophecies were fulfilled. The Messiah had come. We too need to know and to fully understand that wherever he is, whatever he does, God always makes a difference. He stirs hearts, churches, communities. He makes new. He creates life. Only in him does life make sense. Only God makes the difference. And so for us, this Palm Sunday, this story shows us that we can fully trust God, that he knows what he's doing. And in days like these, it is a time for us, all of us, to let go and let God. We must with confidence know that he is Lord and that it is he and he alone that prepares the way for us. It is he and he alone that fulfills his promises to us. And it is he and he alone that makes all the difference in our lives and our circumstances. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, I thank you that you are a God that is sovereign, that you are in control, and that you go before us. You plan ahead. You plan our paths. 
I thank you, Lord, that you fulfill your promises. Every detail, every word you speak over us, you will do. And Lord, I rejoice that you are a God that makes a difference, that you stir the hearts of men and women. Lord, just as all the city was stirred when you came into Jerusalem on this Palm Sunday, I pray, O oh Lord, that all of this church at Amon will be stirred. All at our community in Tonguinlice and the land around will be stirred. Lord, I pray that as we exalt you, as we lift you high, as we say this is Jesus, that the hearts of all will be stirred and turned to you. Lord, help us and bless us and anoint us and be with us. Help us this week, Lord, to live for you and to be an example to those around us. In Jesus' name, amen. Thank you.
Let's pray. Lord, we thank you for that first Palm Sunday. Thank you that as you rode into Jerusalem on that donkey, you had the cross in mind, that you had us in mind. Thank you for your sacrificial death for each one of us so that we may know the newness of eternal life. Help us to live each day in the light of this sure and steadfast hope that we have because of you. And now may the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with us all evermore. Amen.